Is it protein restriction that's helping us live longer, or is it caloric restriction that's helping us live longer? Believe it or not, caloric restriction and protein restriction work along similar pathways, but also very different. So if we want to live longer, should we be reducing our protein? Is it something that we should be paying attention to? The short answer is yes, we should be paying attention to it, but we run into this catch-22. The catch-22 is simple. We eat more protein, it allows us to build muscle. We build muscle, we have more metabolic advantages. We have ability to absorb glucose better and have less risk of insulin resistance. We're less frail if we take a fall. Now on the other side of things, protein also stimulates mTOR, which is the opposite of autophagy. So our cellular recycling doesn't work as well. There's also numerous studies that indicate that essential amino acids actually drive up the overall like anti-longevity process. So where do we find this delicate balance? Let's go ahead and dive in. It comes down to a hormetic curve. Not enough protein, that's going to be a problem because you're not able to rebuild and not have tissue. Too much protein, that's gonna be a problem because you're left with extra amino acids that aren't really going to work. Now, proteins are made up of 21 different amino acids. 12 of them are non-essential, meaning the body can make them. Nine of them are essential, meaning we need to get them from the diet. This may sound like very basic nutrition, but it plays a very important role. Let me explain in the sense of an analogy as far as building tissue and building cells in our body is concerned. So to make some sense of all of this, I have a contractor analogy, a building analogy, and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Let's pretend for a second you're a builder and you are building cells, houses, cells. And to build these cells, you need bricks. Okay, so you go to the store and you buy a bunch of bricks. These bricks are non-essential amino acids, non-essential bricks, meaning you can easily get them from a store. And you start building a house and then you realize there's very specific parts that you need that you have to special order. And you're only gonna get those special order bricks from another store, or in this case, the diet. These are essential bricks. You can build part of a house or part of a cell, but not a complete cell without these essential amino acids. So as a responsible builder, you only start building houses or building cells when you know you have enough of these unique bricks or essential bricks, essential amino acids available. What I'm getting at with this is that the building process for cells in our body does not start unless we have the essential aminos available. So growth and that entire signaling only happens when essential amino acids are coming in from the diet. The amino acids that we can build within our body do not trigger mTOR and do not trigger growth the same way that getting it from the diet would. Now we see this even in studies, right? There's a study that was published in the journal Nature that took a look at flies. They do a lot of longevity studies on flies because they can study them for a long period of time and get their whole life, right? What they found with this is that when they restricted calories in these flies, it extended their lifespan. Okay, no surprise. But when they supplemented essential amino acids alongside the same caloric restriction, it negated the entire longevity benefit. Now they said, let's go ahead and supplement with non-essential. And it did not affect the longevity benefit. So essential amino acids actually negated the effects of the caloric restriction in the flies. That is demonstrating that specific amino acids play a role. Now that's essential amino acids specifically, but what about one amino acid at a time? What about specific things like that? Well, that's where it gets very interesting because there are studies in mice that demonstrate that even just removing one single essential amino acid can influence longevity. There's a study published in the journal Nutrition that was very intriguing, okay, and it looked at just this. Okay, they took a look at rats and they gave them a regular chow diet. This regular chow diet had 0.86% methionine. Okay, and then what they did is they reduced the methionine content down to 0.17% methionine. The rats that had the lower methionine, the 0.17% methionine diet, ended up living 30% longer. However, they were much smaller and they ended up eating less. So the argument comes to play, okay, well they ate less. Maybe that's why they lived longer. Well, not exactly, because the researchers adjusted for this and they said, okay, well let's also take the same mice that are eating the high methionine diet 
let's reduce their calories to match the low methionine diet. So they ate the same amount of calories and they still did not have a longevity effect. Only the methionine reduced diet had the longevity effect. So is methionine the big issue here? It could be. Methionine could be an actual issue. Does it mean you have to get rid of methionine entirely? No, but it might be an amino acid that you pay attention to reducing a little bit more just by simply looking at which foods have high amounts of methionine in them. Now, I still think protein is very important. I still think it's very critical, no matter what. We're gonna get into some more breakdown on this caloric restriction versus protein restriction. But I put a link down below for ButcherBox because the protein that you get in should be high quality protein. ButcherBox is a sponsor on this channel. They've been on my channel for five plus years, but they have grass-fed, grass-finished meat Okay, and they have really good quality poultry, really good quality pork, which is rich in monounsaturated fats and not so much in the saturated fats. They also have sustainable seafood options too. So they have wild caught cod, they have wild caught sockeye salmon, they have wild caught scallops, really cool stuff that is quality focused. So I put that link down below. It gets delivered directly to your doorstep, super, super easy and convenient. My point in saying this is, even if you are trying to reduce protein because you're concerned with the longevity attribute, this is where quality matters. So if you're gonna consume less protein, get the good quality protein, where you can get micronutrients out of it, where you can get the good fats that you want out of it, and where you get the grass-fed, grass-finished stuff with higher omega-3 content. It does make a difference if you do start reducing protein or you're being cognizant of it. So that link is down below. Again, you go on, you can get my custom boxes, see the kind of stuff that I order as well, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep in a couple of days, super easy. So that link down below. So now we have to remember this balance of mTOR and autophagy, right? So being able to build cells and build tissue is very important, all right? But if we do not occasionally pump the brakes and restrict calories and also restrict protein, then we do not get the benefits of autophagy. And we do not get the benefits of mitophagy, where our cells and our mitochondria actually consolidate to get stronger and more efficient. Would you rather have 10 really crappy houses that you can't really do much with, that have holes in the walls and holes in the ceilings? Or would you rather have two nice houses with nice ceilings that actually work and roofs that keep out water and HVAC and climate control, right? Do the math, right? So we can build and build and build, but if we don't occasionally restrict, we don't ever get the benefit of consolidation and making things better. If you have 10 homes, you can't focus on the quality and the integrity of those 10 homes by yourself. If you have two homes, maybe one home, you can manage it and you can deal with it and you have quality, and you'll probably live a longer, happier life, right? So it's very, very important that occasionally, no matter what your strategy is, you reduce protein now and then, okay? You don't have to do it all the time, but also reduce calories altogether. We have more to talk about though. So we talked about mTOR, autophagy, and all that, but what about something called SAM? Who the heck is SAM? SAM stands for S-adenosylmethionine, okay? And it is something very similar to mTOR in some ways, but what it does is, well, let's talk about how it accumulates first. In older people, older animals, you see a high level of S-adenosylmethionine, a high level of SAM. We've also seen that when you encourage the breakdown of SAM, when you encourage the breakdown of SAM, subjects live longer, species live longer. So the more that you catabolize SAM, the more that you can potentially live longer. The reason that this is, is because SAM blocks autophagy. It does, and it directly stimulates mTOR via something called, believe it or not, SAMTOR, S-adenosylmethionine mammalian target of rapamycin. Say that 10 times fast, okay? So basically it stops, it blocks autophagy. Not a good thing. Well, guess what builds SAM? S-adenosylmethionine. Methionine turns into SAM. Do you need to restrict methionine entirely? No, but we've seen that if you reduce it a little bit, you can have some benefit. So perhaps to reduce this SAM, we periodically peel back methionine. Do a quick search on Google to see which foods are rich in methionine or which foods are still complete proteins with maybe lower amounts of methionine. Okay? It could make a big difference. Also, when we restrict proteins, we increase something called FGF21. FGF21 stimulates more mitochondrial biogenesis. It's good for mitochondrial function. It also encourages glucose uptake into the cell and it encourages fatty acid oxidation 
and it encourages ketogenesis. So it improves how efficiently we create ketones. So when you look at the original therapeutic ketogenic diet, it was all about reducing protein and increasing fats, which makes sense from a therapeutic side to really drive up these values. So what do I recommend in this particular case? Well, occasionally do a lower carb protocol and restrict the protein. What you do does not have to be what you do forever. I think that's the problem that we have in this society is we want to check a box and we want to stick with that. We want to become vegan and stay vegan. We want to do carnivore and we want to stay carnivore. Heck, switch it up. Do keto with some plant-based every now and then. Do keto with some carnivore now and then. Do keto with high calorie. Do keto with low calorie. Do keto with high protein. Do keto with low protein. Mix it up. Okay, so that you're getting a net balance of possibly a little less methionine in this particular case. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at some people that are in a particular uh, tribe in Ecuador, there's this dwarf tribe, a group of people that are dwarfs, and they are all very low IGF. They have an IGF issue, an IGF deficiency. So what that means is that when we consume protein, we also stimulate IGF, which triggers growth. So these particular people, although small, obviously, because they don't have IGF, they tend to possibly live longer, but they also have less incidence of cancer and other metabolic disorders as well. Kind of interesting. So then it begs the big question, what matters most, protein restriction or calorie restriction? And there was an interesting study in the journal Biochemica at Biophysica Alta. Very interesting because this study demonstrated that they think about half the benefits of life expansion come from protein restriction and half the benefits come from caloric restriction. Possibly two different pathways, okay, but benefits from each. But then there was another study published in the journal of gerontology. And this particular study actually looked at mice and they calorically restricted the mice and the calorically restricted mice lived 75% longer. But the protein restricted mice that restricted their protein amounts by 40% only lived 15% longer. So what do we get with this? Well, in this particular case, we say, okay, well maybe protein restriction is more sustainable. So I'll take a 15% benefit, 15% life extension if I can actually stick with it. But the real life extension is gonna come from caloric restriction. So do you do some periods of caloric restriction and some periods of protein restriction? And that's exactly where a balance of fasting in the strategic way comes into place, right? If you do periods of fasting you can lower your overall net protein intake long term, but still get protein when you need it at the end of your fast. You're getting the benefits of caloric restriction and also having the benefits of protein. And then you take periods of time when you're not fasting, when maybe you reduced your protein levels too. If we are potentially working upon different pathways, let's capitalize on both of them. Let's have periods of time with caloric restriction, but moderate to moderately high protein in consolidated periods of time where it's not always having this. If we go back to the builder analogy, we're not always having a signal to build, 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 but we're occasionally having a signal to build. So if you mix this up with fasting now and then, we're three days a week with fasting with higher protein, and then a couple days per week where you're just reducing protein and going higher fat, that could be the strategy when it comes down to longevity. But it's all conceptual, and I'm just some dude on the internet. I'll see you tomorrow.